today we have with us Dr. James King, who is a neurosurgeon and pituitary expert from the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So thank you for joining us, James. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So firstly, we'd like to ask you, um, what is a craniotomy? So a craniotomy is any operation that involves an incision on the scalp and lifting a window in the bone of the skull. And it's done for a variety of different uh, problems, typically for removal of tumours of the brain or the coverings of the brain, uh, for aneurysms, and occasionally, and actually quite rarely, for pituitary tumours. Well, who is involved in the surgical team? So uh, there's typically a lead surgeon and then the surgical assistant who's usually training in neurosurgery or a more junior member of the surgical team. There's a, a scrub nurse who provides the equipment uh, during the operation, uh, the anaesthetist who um, puts the patient to sleep and then uh, monitors them during the, the surgical procedure and, and wakes them up from the, from the operation at the end. There are technicians in the theatre and uh, scout nurses that go and get equipment as required. So it's generally quite a big team, usually seven or eight people in the operating room, uh, all caring for the patient. Um, so there's two types of um, pituitary surgery. There's a craniotomy and there's also the transsynoidal um, method of surgery. What are the risks of the craniotomy and what are they compared to the transsynoidal surgery? Really, almost all pituitary surgeons favour uh, transphenoidal surgery or, or surgery that's done through the nose uh, for a variety of different reasons. And I think in most modern pituitary surgeons' practices, transphenoidal surgery outweighs craniotomy by a very significant number, maybe even 100 to 1. Uh, so it's rare to do a craniotomy for pituitary tumours or pituitary disease. And I think in general, most surgeons would consider a craniotomy slightly higher risk than transphenoidal surgery. In, in general terms, there's the risk of the anaesthetic, which is similar in both cases, but anytime you, you open the skull, there's a small risk of infection or bleeding. Uh, typically, we would say they are low risks, one to 2%. If a, a blood clot forms after surgery, it can sometimes necessitate a reoperation to, to remove the blood clot. Whilst Surgery for pituitary tumours done via a craniotomy does not typically go through the brain. It, the brain is slightly elevated or dissected, and in some cases that can cause injury to the brain or even epilepsy after surgery. And there's a remote risk of a very serious complication, such as stroke or even death from, from craniotomy. So it's certainly a serious operation and it's not embarked upon lightly. And in general, it would require a patient to have a type of tumour that would be very difficult to access through the nose. And, and it's usually because there's a very large intracranial component. What's the difference in recovery time from the craniotomy compared to transphenoidal surgery? So with transphenoidal surgery, most patients would stay in uh, two or three nights in hospital. And the majority of that is for checking hormone levels and really just making sure that the patient's are really quite well before they are sent home. I think a craniotomy in most cases, the length of stay would be slightly longer, but probably not all that much longer, maybe one to two days longer. But there's certainly more, I think, wound pain in general. I think the recovery is a bit slower. I, I'd say patients that have had a craniotomy would typically need four to six weeks sometimes off work. And unfortunately, if you do an operation through the side of the head, a craniotomy, the guidelines are that you shouldn't drive for the three months after surgery. So that, that has a very significant implication for some patients. And is there any proven difference in the outcomes between the two? So look, they've not been really studied head to head because they're very different operations and you really are not treating the same condition typically. Most surgeons uh, would be preferentially going through the nose to remove a pituitary tumour. I think the risks of craniotomy are slightly higher and therefore that would be not the preferred surgical option. I think currently when we're experiencing the COVID crisis, there is a concern that surgery up the nose is of higher risk to the surgical team of spreading the virus. And 
there may be an increase in the need to perform craniotomy in the current environment. I think there is a higher risk to the pituitary function when the surgery is done through the nose, because I think it's surgery that probably is going to damage the normal pituitary gland a little bit more than if you do the surgery through the nose. But that would probably be the main difference, I think. And um, in terms of infection, what's the risk of infection with a craniotomy and versus a transphenoidal surgery? Infection in craniotomy is rare, and we typically quote less than 1% risk. Infection after pituitary surgery is also rare, fortunately. I, I think the risks are probably equivalent. The, the risk of CSF leak is probably higher with transphenoidal surgery because you're opening the base of the skull, which you don't do uh, via a craniotomy. So that would be one difference in risk profile. Do you have to leave anything in the brain like metal plates or screws or anything after a craniotomy? So the bone window, the piece of bone that was removed for the surgery needs to be secured and it is held with usually three or four small plates that are made of titanium with screws that hold the bone in position. But typically over the following months, the bone heals and becomes solid. Those plates though are typically left in situ. They're very small and then they don't generally cause any particular problems to the patient. And you can still have an MRI, for example, with those little plates in. I think the, the risks between uh, pituitary surgery done via a craniotomy and, and via a transphenoidal route are different. The, the craniotomy involves a risk of infection or bleeding, and typically that would be low risk, 1% to 2%. Because you are dissecting in the fold bet between the lobes of the brain to expose the pituitary region, you do run the risk of causing damage to the brain or epilepsy. Again, those risks would be low within a few percent. There would be a small risk of injury to the pituitary gland itself and the requirement for pituitary hormones. Again, I would say that risk might be a few percent. The risk of uh, damage to the optic apparatus, I would say slightly higher in craniotomy than in transphenoidal surgery. And again, would be in the realm of perhaps up to 5%. So I think if you add the risks of craniotomy, uh, they would come up to more than 10% risk, which I think would generally be higher than what the risks that we would quote with, with transphenoidal surgery, where the overall risks might be sort of two to 3% risk of a complication. Obviously, the risks do depend on the type of disease, the extent of the disease, the size of the tumor, and the experience of the surgeon. And uh, it is hard to make generalizations but I think the transphenoidal surgery risk is generally low. There, I would quote a one in 50 chance of a CSF leak that occurs postoperatively. It may be actually slightly lower than that. A very small risk of new endocrine deficit, again, one or 2%. And, and the risk of visual deterioration after transphenoidal surgery, again, is very low. I'd say less than 1%. So I think there are different risk profile but craniotomy is definitely a more challenging procedure for the patient psychologically and physically to recover from, in my experience. And when you add the time off work and the time off driving, I think it is a more significant experience for the patient. So once I've had a craniotomy, can I have transphenoidal surgery and vice versa? So the answer is yes, but I think having had previous cranial surgery can complicate uh, transphenoidal surgery and certainly the reverse can also be true so for example in transnasal surgery particularly with soft tumors we rely on suction and and gravity effect to allow the tumor to come down into the cellar and into the nose to remove it and if someone has had previous cranial surgery there's some scarring in the region of the pituitary and the optic nerves and it may be more difficult for that tumour to descend and be removed. If you've had previous transphenoidal surgery and then you do a craniotomy, um, you would want to make sure that the cellar is completely sealed. And uh, again, you might have some scarring that would make surgery a bit more difficult. But I, I don't think one excludes the other. How many craniotomies would you perform in a year? <laughs> 
so for pituitary tumors, it would actually be one or two out of 70 cases. So it's a small percentage of the work for pituitary tumors, but it's a more significant percentage for other diseases of the brain. It's a little bit difficult to give an exact figure, but I would say it's probably somewhere up to close to 100 craniotomies a year. So it's a fairly common operation for a, a cranial neurosurgeon for a variety of different diseases. If I had apoplexy now in my pituitary tumour, what approach would you favour? So apoplexy is quite a spectrum of, of clinical symptoms and signs. So if, if a patient now had very severe apoplexy, uh, which can cause visual loss or even blindness. We have been advised by the Neurosurgical Society of Australia and by neurosurgeons worldwide that the risk of doing surgery through the nose is high in spreading the virus to surgeons or operating room personnel. And uh, for that reason, because we can't guarantee that the patient doesn't have COVID-19, uh, we've been advised to perform the surgery via craniotomy. So it is a big change, and I personally haven't been in that experience yet, but we are relatively early in this, this viral pandemic, and I think there will be patients that will need to be offered craniotomy to save their vision during this time, which is pretty exceptional, because typically those patients would be treated through the nose. I have encouraged pretty much all my patients to wait. Uh, mm. I have discussed it with them and particularly the ones that have a degree of visual loss. I've said to them, you know, I think we should closely monitor your vision and do frequent scans during this period. And hopefully we can get you through this period and do the surgery via the transfernoidal or nasal route as soon as we can, rather than to do a craniotomy where I think the risks are slightly higher and the likelihood of uh, a, a good removal of the tumour is probably slightly lower too. Mm. So of the patients that I've discussed it with so far, all have agreed to wait for treatment uh, when it can be done by the standard transfer order route. Thank you, James, for your time today and helping us understand a little bit more about craniotomies. You're welcome. It was uh, good to chat with you. Yeah.